Um, well, anyways, today I'm going to talk about the PFLP, which is um, a Marxist-Leninist uh, Palestinian organization. It's the, the, that acronym stands for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And um, it is kind of an interesting um, organization in that it is, I mean, it seems like these days there aren't that many really active Marxist organizations around. I mean, Greg talked a little bit about um, these uh, Maoist rebels in, uh, in Nepal. Um, but in uh, Palestine, this is still, they're not one of the major Palestinian factions like Hamas or Fatah, which you always hear about. But they still have a decent amount of support. In fact, they just had their 42nd uh, anniversary um, very recently. And so um, in Gaza, they had a big rally where there was about 70,000 people there or so. How many? <clears throat> about 70,000. So um, again, smaller than Hamas and Fatah, but um, you know they still are part of the uh, the PLO, the Palestine uh, Liberation Organization, and they still they still play a role in Palestinian politics. So um, to begin, I do just need to cover a little bit of history. I'd assume a lot of you guys probably do know a decent amount about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Anyone raise their hand who feels like they know quite a bit about it? Okay, well, I'll try to give a brief history to understand a little bit more about what I'll talk about later, but um, basically the Israeli-Palestinian conflict started as a result of an ideology called Zionism, which you guys have probably heard of. And Zionism is basically the idea of Jewish nationalism, that there should be a Jewish homeland, um, but not just anywhere in the world, although initially there were different ideas about where that homeland should be. Uh, but it ended up evolving into the idea that there should be a Jewish homeland in the place where anciently the Jewish people lived, uh, as evidenced by uh, the historical record of the Old Testament or the, or the Hebrew Bible, so in what we obviously today know as Israel. Um, now the problem with um, an ideology like Zionism is that, um, you know, when you first kind of think about it, at least growing up in the United States where you... Um, you know, learn a lot about the history of the Jewish people, you learn a lot about the Holocaust, you learn a lot about anti-Semitism and the history of persecution of the Jews. And so when you first hear about the idea of there being a Jewish state, um, a, like a safe place for the Jewish people to have their own homeland, it seems like a pretty good idea, right? And obviously due to these terrible things like the Holocaust and so forth, you definitely want there to be a safe place for, for Jews as people. The problem with that ideology, however, is that the place that was chosen, again based on the Jews historically having lived in that part of the world, was already populated by Arabs. So it's just kind of like, what's the problem with uh, Europeans uh, fleeing uh, religious persecution in Europe and coming to America? Again, it seems like a pretty good idea until you remember, oh wait, there's Native Americans here. And if you're going to have a white Christian country, well, you know, what do you do with the people who are already living here who are of a different race, religion, culture, etc.? And obviously we know the answer of what happened in the Americas, um, where Native Americans were largely exterminated. And there's a similar, again, the, the, we have the same problem in, um, again, what used to be known as Palestine and now is largely known as Israel, is that Arabs were living there, going about their business like they had been for generations and hundreds of years. Um, and so when the Zionist movement really gained steam and large-scale immigration of Jews um, began to Palestine, um, there was the idea in the minds of the Zionist leaders, like David Ben-Gurion and Yosefites, etc., that, hey, there are these Arabs here, this is land that we want for there to be a Jewish homeland where there's a majority of Jewish people here, and so what do you do with Arabs? Well, you either have to kill them, or forcibly evict or transfer them to somewhere else. And there were other Zionists who didn't agree with that approach. They said, well, hey, we should live alongside the Arabs, and there should be like a binational state, etc. But at the end of the day, it was the Zionists who felt like, hey, we should just forcibly expel, or in the words we'd use uh, maybe more often today, we should ethnically cleanse uh, Palestinians or Arabs who are currently living here through violence, get rid of them, send them off to Jordan or Lebanon or wherever else, and then we'll have our Jewish state where there's primarily either just or primarily Jews here. So that's what happened in 1948. There was actually a vote 
uh, at the UN to partition um, what was then called Mandatory Palestine, which is a British colony. Uh, the British were occupying that period of land ever since World War I. And so a lot of people think that the state of Israel is created as a result of this vote at the UN to partition uh, the country. However, that vote, that vote did take place in late 1947. However, it was actually simply through violence that the state of Israel was created. The Jews that had immigrated to uh, mandatory Palestine uh, before that time, many of them had served in the British military um, during World War I, during World War II. And so the Jews were able to, that were living there were able to create um, you know, pretty organized paramilitary organizations. And so, um, again, in late to 1947 through 1948, um, the Jewish paramilitary organizations basically swept through um, man, most about 78% of mandatory Palestine, basically destroyed uh, all the Arab villages that they could. They would go into a village um, basically sometimes massacre large numbers of people, other times simply round everyone up to the center of the town, put dynamite in pretty much every house and every, every public building, blow up all the houses and buildings, and send the Palestinians marching, again, whether to Jordan or to Gaza, which at that time came under Egyptian control, or to Lebanon, or in the case of Haifa and Jaffa and some of the cities on, uh, on the coast, Palestinians were actually forced into boats and had to flee by boat, uh, again, largely to Lebanon. So um, this is the situation that um, the founder of the PFLP experienced. His name was uh, George Habash. And um, he um, was actually a medical student in Lebanon at the time, but shortly before the war started, he had returned home to a town called Lida. Um, in, again, mandatory Palestine at the time. And he, along with his family, um, was forced by the Jewish armies um, out of their home and they were forced to march um, basically to Lebanon and this was, um, his family took part in something called the Lida Death March where um, thousands of Palestinians were forced to march for days with no water and food and so forth uh, basically to the Arab front and so um, thousands and thousands of Palestinians died uh, during that time during that march from their homes and their village as the Zionist armies came through and cleared everybody out. So that, what the um, Israelis call the War of Independence, the Palestinians call the catastrophe, or the Nakba, and that's what created the Palestinian refugee problem. Um, so again, you had about 750,000 Palestinians who were displaced, um, pushed out of what later became the borders of the State of Israel, lost their homes, lost their possessions, became refugees again in Lebanon, Jordan, or in Gaza primarily, and essentially became propertyless, stateless, and extremely poor. So um, again, George Habash, his family um, was expelled from their homes during this period of time, and so um, he ended up creating, or starting an organization called the Arab Nationalist Movement, um, which then later, finally in 1967, um, along with a couple other organizations, um, became known as the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And about two years later, they officially adopted Marxist-Leninist um, doctrine. And the reason for that is they essentially saw in Marxism a way to kind of interpret their situation and understand why it is that what happened to Palestinians actually happened. And this is the way they saw it. They felt that the imperialist countries, um, Western countries, the United States, etc., basically were trying to control the Middle East for the sake of controlling oil resources so that the United States and other Western countries could, at very cheap prices, import oil into, for example, the U.S. economy, um, use those oil resources to produce manufactured goods, which then could then be sold back to these different Arab countries, which was kind of like a captive market, and these Arab countries would then import back these products at, and pay much higher prices for them than the Americans, uh, for example, would have uh, paid to produce these things. And so there's this kind of cycle of exploitation where the United States gets cheap oil, manufactures these things, and then has a captive kind of colonial market to sell their goods at and just slowly um, exploit those countries more and more and accumulate more and more resources and capital. 
So in an effort to maintain um, uh, Western control over the Middle East, countries like the United States were looking for you know, agents that could uh, essentially ensure their control. And so the state of Israel was one of those agents. If the United States is a very, very close ally of Israel, gives them weapons, money, um, etc., technology, that allows the United States to essentially have a foothold in the Middle East, have like essentially an American military base in the Middle East, and if any popular um, nationalist or Marxist movements arise to try and take control of Middle Eastern resources and stop this um, exploitative relationship between the imperialist countries in the West and those com developing countries in the Middle East, that Israel is there basically to essentially stamp that out and kind of take orders from the United States. So a lot of people would view Israel essentially as America's like watchdog in the Middle East. Um, so anyways, through uh, Marxism they were able to kind of you know, analyze, hey this is the situation, and then through Leninism they felt like that gave them the tools to organize properly to try and um, defeat Zionism, which had directly displaced them from their homes and taken their homeland. <coughs> But then also um, to be part of the broader fight against imperialism. So kind of in contrast to kind of what went on in Europe where, like Greg was mentioning, where in World War I these um, different socialists in different countries felt like, hey, national, you know, we do need to fight for our own country and this maybe isn't in the interest of socialism now, but it's just kind of a necessary thing. Or other socialists who would have said, no, let's not fight at all. Palestinians, in the PFLP at least, definitely saw the, the Palestinian nationalism um, or the liberation of Palestine from the Zionist entity, as they would call it, as part of this broad, broader struggle against imperialism. And they also saw the state of Israel um, as, again, what they called um, a racist colonial settler state. Again, uh, the colonial aspect, because Jews had come from all over the world to colonize Palestine, take the land from the indigenous inhabitants. Uh, that's, that would be the colonial settler aspect of it. And then the racist aspect of it is, again, this idea that this is a place that should be essentially just for Jews. And so what do you do with the rest of the people? Well, you have to get, get rid of them somehow. So what the PFLP wanted um, was to replace the state of Israel, which, again, they considered a colonial, a racist colonial settler state with a democratic, secular state like you would have, say, here in the United States, albeit a socialist one, obviously. So, for example, um, I took a course um, when I was at Harvard from a professor named Ephraim Karsh, who is um, a um, pretty famous guy. He normally teaches at a college in London and worked for Israeli intelligence for a long time and then became a professor. And he was always in class saying things like, you know, why do people question the, the right of the state of Israel to exist? We're a country just like France is a country, just like Britain is a country, and so on and so forth. But of course that's not true because, you know, even though obviously there's racism in France, you don't have to be of a particular race or religion to be French. You can be white and Catholic or Protestant or now obviously there are many Arabs. Same thing with the United States. Previously, there was that idea that you had to be like a white Protestant, essentially, to have like full rights here in the United States. But eventually, you know, things have improved, and so the notion of who is an American has expanded. So now, of course, you can be African American, where previously that would not have made you a citizen. You would have obviously been a slave. Previously, you couldn't have been a Native American and be an American citizen. Um, but now, we've moved to the point where those things don't matter to us and there's no one here in the United States trying to maintain the United States as like a white Christian state. So the state of Israel is still kind of in that stage that the United States used to be in where they do take race and religion into account as, and trying to maintain a homogenous society of that kind. Um, so at any rate, the PFLP they saw as their enemies, first of all Israel of course because it had displaced them from their homes, they saw as their enemy world Zionism, um, you know, which since there are, 
you know, Jews throughout different um, countries of the world, some of whom are Zionists or believe in that idea of creating a Jewish homeland, and which has, of course, now been created and now maintaining it. So, of course, you have like the Jewish lobby here in the United States, you know, trying to, um, you know, influence people in Congress, et cetera, to try and get support for Israel. They also, again, saw as their um, enemy of world imperialism, uh, the United States, etc. And then the other enemy that they uh, that they saw was in the reactionary Arab regimes, who, uh, for example, like Egypt, the Egyptian government now, the Jordanian government now, who even though they pay lip service to saying that they're opposed to Zionism or supporting the Palestinians, um, in the actuality they are dependent upon the United States. And they receive a lot of benefits from this uh, colonial relationship where they're kind of like the local elites that um, make a lot of money off of these economic relationships, get a lot of aid from the United States, which basically they just put in their own pockets. And so even though they say that they you know, are opposed to the United States and opposed to Israel, in fact they're making a lot of money that way. So, for example, President Mubarak of Egypt during this most recent siege on Gaza um, about a year ago, he easily could have opened the borders and allowed um, Gazans to flee from, um, uh, from Gaza and escape the bombing, or for uh, humanitarian aid to flow in, or even for weapons and money to flow in for the Palestinians to help fight against the Israeli onslaught. But, of course, Mubarak kept the borders totally sealed. And so, essentially, these days, now, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel are very close allies, even though, kind of, they act like, the Israelis and the Egyptians act like they kind of don't like each other, but, in fact, they cooperate all the time. And essentially have the same interests. They're both dependent upon uh, the United States to basically stay, uh, to stay in power. So, um, to give a little more uh, history, uh, again, George Habash um, started um, the PFLP in 1967. Um, and they started doing uh, these really pretty um, uh, daring operations. A lot of people associate um, terrorism now with Muslims, right? And a lot of times with terrorism you associate airplane hijackings, right? But the first group to pioneer airplane hijackings was the PFLP, whose leader, George Habash, was actually an Orthodox Christian. and. Um, in one pretty famous incident in 1970, the PFLP hijacked um, four different airplanes from that were taking off in European cities. Um, ended up landing three of those in an airfield outside of um, Amman in Jordan, um, and there was kind of a standoff there. They ended up evacuating uh, all of the hostages from the airplanes. A lot of them they sent to Amman, um, and then they ended up blowing up the airplanes as a way to you know, basically garner support and bring attention to the, the Palestinian cause. Um, there are some things that the PFLP did that could definitely be, or should definitely be characterized as terrorism in terms of targeting civilians and things like that, which I would, of course, uh, disagree with. One famous incident was called the Laud uh, Airport Massacre, where um, it was, there was an operation that was actually that was carried out on behalf of the PFLP, actually by three members of the Japanese Red Army, which is a Marxist faction from Japan. And these three Japanese guys flew into to the airport in Tel Aviv. Um, it had nice suits on and um, had violin cases, essentially. And as they after they got into the airport, they opened up their violin cases and just started opening fire on people, and they killed about 26 people or so. Um, so obviously that's something I disagree with, um, but of course that does also need to be kept in um, in, con in the context of many, many massacres that the Israelis have committed against Palestinians, especially in 1948, um, but also after that. Um, I mean, there's a long history, of course, of Israeli state terrorism of um, targeting Palestinian civilians directly. So much like in, in the case of the fighting between American um, settlers and Native Americans. Um, certainly there were cases when Native Americans committed atrocities against white settlers. Um, but the vast majority of the atrocities were committed by the U.S. Army, for example. And of course it was the Americans who had this aggressive thrust to steal land from Native Americans. And the Amer Native Americans were trying to resist that. 
Same thing with Israelis and Palestinians. You're going to find that there's atrocities and terrorism on both sides, but the levels of terrorism and the atrocities committed on the Israeli side are much, much higher, um, and, is, and Palestinians are trying to, again, resist the further colonization of their land and, and their homes being stolen, having to live under occupation, having uh, no basic civil or political rights and things like that. So that's uh, important to remember. Um, one of the other operations that was um, really pretty, um, um, along with those airplane hijackings that I mentioned, was um, in 1982, again, uh, the Palestinian fighters had been pushed initially, um, or refugees had been pushed to Jordan, Lebanon, etc. And by 1982, most of the Palestinian guerrillas from the PFLP, but also from Fatah and some of the other factions had uh, been, were based in Lebanon. And there was actually a split-off group from the PFLP called the, the PFLP General Command, led by a guy named, named Ahmed Jabril, who felt that the mainstream uh, PFLP was too interested in like Marxist theorizing and not putting enough uh, focus into armed struggle. And so he split off actually pretty early on in, in 1968 and kind of had this parallel organization. But one of the guerrillas from the PFLP General Command in 1982 um, that was based in Lebanon uh, ended up flying a, a motorized hang glider from the uh, southern Lebanon, which was at the time was occupied by the Israelis, flying that across out of that occupied zone across the border, staying really, really low, just basically at tree level. So even though he was picked up by Israeli radar, they sent some helicopters out to look for them and they couldn't find anything. It had a, the hang glider had a motor the size of like a lawnmower engine on it. Managed to fly it, um, you know, within a couple hundred yards of an Israeli military base. Um, landed the glider in a field. Uh, an Israeli military truck was driving by. He opened fire on the truck and killed the driver. Managed then to infiltrate the Israeli military base. And um, using grenades and an AK-47, which is all I had on him. He managed to kill five Israeli soldiers and kill, or, and then injure about 25, I think. And then finally another Israeli soldier managed to, managed to shoot and kill him. But that was like a very, very famous operation because again, Palestinians, compared to what the Israelis have in terms of firepower, the Israelis have the, like the fourth strongest military in the world with F-16s and all the weapons you could ever imagine that America could possibly give to anyone. The Israelis have that, nuclear weapons, etc. And Palestinians, of course, have, have very little. Um, and so for a Palestinian guerrilla to infiltrate an Israeli military base like that in such a fantastic uh, way was like a major... Um, kind of morale boost for Palestinians, and that was just about a week before the first intifada began um, in 1987 is when he did that operation. And so um, some people say that that kind of, in a way, helped spark the first uh, intifada. Um, but even when I was in Gaza a couple years ago, like people, that's how I first heard about this, I didn't read about it first, there were people who would, like told me about it and it still like gets discussed and talked about. Um, because it was such a, um, again, a morale booster for, for Palestinians. Um, more recently, um, the uh, general secretary, or again, the founder, George Habash, he, for all those years, managed to avoid getting assassinated by the Israelis, finally uh, resigned from being uh, the head of the party in the year 2000. He was replaced by a guy named Abu Ali Mustafa. Um, who was the general secretary just for a couple months, and then he was um, assassinated um, in his office in Ramallah in the West Bank by an Israeli missile strike from a helicopter. And so the PFLP, they named their armed wing um, after him, so they now call their armed wing the Abu Ali Mustafa Brigades. And um, in, uh, in response to that assassination, um, some PFLP guerrillas um, did another operation, which is also really famous and that a lot of people, you know, talk about still, which was that um, these Palestinian guerrillas assassinated the Israeli tourism minister in, I believe that was in 2001, and he was just staying at a hotel at the time at the, at the, at the Hyatt in Jerusalem, and these four guys basically just posed as regular guests at the hotel, 
stayed there for a couple of days, probably party a lot, drank a lot of alcohol, and just acted like they were normal kind of tourists having a good time. And when the tourism minister showed up, they, um, they managed to shoot him, uh, they killed him, and then managed to flee to the West Bank and um, basically took refuge in like the, the Palestinian Authority headquarters where Yasser Arafat was, was based. So the Israelis then basically laid siege to the Palestinian Authority headquarters. Um, and finally a deal was brokered where um, these four guys would be arrested by the Palestinian Authority, taken to a prison, a Palestinian prison in Jericho, and then guarded by um, American, um, like I believe, people from the FBI essentially. So there's like American guards at this Palestinian prison and they were basically just held there um, kind of indefinitely. Then um, the Israelis and the Americans struck a deal about five years later where the American guards on purpose left uh, the prison facility at a certain time and allowed the Israelis to come and assault the jail and um, capture these guys and take them off to prisons in Israel where, where they are now along with the 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 leader of the PFLP who had succeeded, Abu Ali Mustafa, his name is Ahmed Sadat. And so those four guys plus Ahmed Sadat are currently being held in Israeli jails. And if you guys have been keeping up on any of the negotiations for the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit, who was um, uh, captured by Hamas militants a couple years ago and is still in Hamas custody, um, there's working out a, a prisoner exchange for um, a lot of Palestinian prisoners, I'm not sure the exact number they're trying to get out, but there's about 11,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails right now. And Palestinians have one Israeli prisoner. Um, again, kind of giving you an idea of how um, disproportionate, you know, the odds are. Um, and who has, uh, can, you know, who's able to um, engage in much more violence than the other side. Um, but at any rate, um, Ahmed Sadat and I believe a couple of these guys who carried out that operation are are probably going to be freed if this deal ends up going through to uh, to exchange Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, for um, again a pretty large number of Palestinian uh, prisoners. So again, you're kind of wondering why did they assassinate the tourism minister? That seems like a pretty benign post. Um, but the the tourism minister, his name was Raha, Rahavam Zaevi. And he is a former general in the Israeli military. He fought in the war in 1948 and in a lot of different conflicts since then. And um, he is, a, is among the more racist uh, Zionists, or was um, at the time. He founded a political party um, which advocated um, transferring Palestinians from um, Israel and the West Bank, again, to other Arab countries. And um, he referred to Palestinians as a cancer um, and that Palestinians needed to be uh, gotten rid of the same way that you get rid of lice and things like that. So anyways, he was a pretty right-wing extreme figure and so, um, and again, former, former general in the Israeli army, so that ended up being why they ended up targeting him for the uh, assassination. Um, I guess one more quick thing just about how the PFLP views the peace process. Uh, probably a lot of you guys know that in the early 90s um, there was the Oslo uh, Accords or, or was known as the peace process to essentially where Yasser Arafat signed an agreement with the Israelis to kind of begin moving towards um, building a Palestinian state and that ended up creating um, Yasser Arafat as the president of the Palestinian Authority and allowing him to have basically um, Palestinian security forces, which were just lightly armed with just like light arms, obviously no tanks or helicopters or anything like that. Um, and so Palestinians that bought into the peace process, they saw the Oslo Accords as a way to get a Palestinian state. It turns out from internal Israeli documents and interviews with um, Yitzhak Rabin, who was kind of the architect, who was the Israeli prime minister at the time, and who was the um, architect of the Oslo Accords, that it was basically a way to um, continue Israeli settlement because they didn't talk about any of the final status issues like who would Jerusalem belong to, would the Palestinian refugees be able to return. Um, it, the Oslo Accords didn't allow for any settlements to be dismantled, which were for basically Israeli colonies that were being built in, in the West Bank, the areas that were left of Palestine after the 1948 war. 
And during that period of time of the Oslo Accords, more and more settlements were built. And so at any rate, it's, it's clear now that Rabin had in mind that basically what we're going to do is create this Palestinian authority, and they are basically going to be the ones to police Palestinians, keep Palestinians under control, so that we can just continue building settlements and not have to send our own soldiers into the occupied territories and have them uh, have to, you know, arrest kids and, um, you know, shoot Palestinian civilians, which makes us look really bad on camera when these are caught by the international media and so on and so forth, um, which was going on for um, many, many years after the start, well, even from before the start of the Intifada in 1987, but especially since then. So it's basically a way to turn Palestinians into clients of the Israelis and have them basically do the Israelis' dirty work so that, again, the Israelis could just continue building settlements, take more and more land, etc. So along with Hamas, uh, PFLP kind of recognized this and saw um, largely the members of Fatah who agreed to, this, um, uh, to the Oslo Accords with the Israelis as essentially collaborators with the Israelis, realized it was um, you know, a bad idea to do that. And um, so they, along with Hamas, have, have just uh, totally rejected the peace process and are still, um, you know, pushing for, again, a secular um, democratic state. Um, and um, anyways, for that reason, they actually have very, very good relations, or pretty good relations with Hamas, um, even though, again, the Hamas guys, of course, are religious, and the PFLP, PFLP guys are largely secular. Uh, many of them are atheists, etc. Um, and that's been actually one reason why they haven't, why they've had a hard time becoming like one of the more prominent parties in Palestine is because of the fact that everyone does kind of view them as atheists and Palestinians are quite religious and so they, it makes them kind of nervous oftentimes to support the PFLP so much and it makes them quite um, apt to support Hamas because you know these guys are um, essentially the religious party in Palestine. So that's kind of one, uh, just to, to wrap up here, um, problem it seems like many socialist movements have had is um, basically alienating religious people. I mean, there's so many people in the world currently who are religious, not in Europe anymore, but pretty much everywhere else in the world, you know, people are quite religious, and there's oftentimes this real hostility on the part of socialists towards religious people. In fact, in one aspect of the Chinese constitution, I don't know if anyone's read the Chinese constitution, but it kind of says that, well, Basically, we're going to let people be religious if they want to, but of course we know that religion is nonsense and that, you know, in a very short period of time, religion will disappear once people, you know, learn more and know better. And so it's that kind of antagonism, I think, is, has been a real disservice to socialism because it just prevents the type of unity even that Greg is talking about earlier, whether it's based on class, religion, etc. Like, religion can be a force a reactionary force, obviously, we've seen that many times in history, but it can also be a very progressive revolutionary force, which you'd see in Nicaragua, for example, amongst the Sandinistas, or the civil rights movement here in the United States. And, and um, you know, that's one thing that, for example, the PFLP could have done a better job of, is, is not alienating people by criticizing religion or having this reputation that they're atheists when people in Palestine are quite religious. So.